really a pleasure to be in Bombay. Of course, I'm a Bombay. I grew up in Bombay, studied in high to Bombay, so I have long roots in the city, and it's a great pleasure. In fact, I worked in this building once, so I'm really excited to be here back here after 25 years almost. Um, so uh, I changed the topic a little bit to kind of flip it around from the gloom and doom to kind of see whether we could kind of tell a more hopeful story towards the end. So we have to go through the gloom and doom, but hopefully it will end on a, on a more hopeful note. Um, and so firstly, I think the reason Ravina invited me to speak today is because Bangalore's lakes have been in the news for all the long, uh, wrong reasons. So you, you might have seen uh, these news articles about Bellingham Lake catching fire, Vulture Lake foaming, so to the extent that the foam actually falls out of the lake onto the roads and causes traffic hazards. And then uh, there was a spate of articles on Alsu Lake about fish kills in the lake last summer. And so there's clearly a big problem. And the question is that we want to kind of pursue is, of course, why is this happening? But also what should we do about it? And how should we even think about lakes in the much larger context of uh, water security in cities? So I'm going to start with the history of Bangalore's lakes only because Bangalore is quite different from Bombay. And so I think that if you are not familiar with Bangalore, you've not been there, a little bit of background is kind of useful to know. So the first thing about Bangalore is most of these lakes which are now in the city were originally irrigation tanks. Not all of them, but many of them. And that's just because Bangalore was once a little cantonment town which grew and grew and grew and has now become a mega city. So basically the city grew around, swallowed up the peri-urban areas and what are now lakes were actually originally irrigation tanks. Most of these were built centuries ago, somewhere between uh, it really, so somewhere between five uh, to, uh, to seven centuries, starting five to seven centuries ago, uh, till the very recent ones were built by the British in uh, the late 1800s. Um, so what what do we mean by these tanks? So let me just kind of show you um, this schematic of a tank. A tank is usually a, a, a structure, which is and, and I'm going to use the word tank and lakes interchangeably. Because usually the word tank is applied when you're talking about an irrigation tank, but because many of the irrigation tanks have now become part of the city, urban residents tend to think of them as lakes, but uh, they are really the same thing. So what were these irrigation tanks originally? They were earthen structures, which were basically buns and were constructed by compressing mud along a stream channel. So what they basically were did, did was build small earthen dams on streams, right? And why were they built? They were built primarily for irrigation purposes, so you would have these sluices, and uh, the sluices would be opened, uh, the, the rain would collect during the monsoon, and then in the post-monsoon season, uh, the sluices would be opened and would be used to irrigate a second crop, and the crop was almost entirely always paddy, right, because it was flood irrigated paddy. Um, and the, the tanks also performed, obviously they were village, I mean they were in the village, they were the local village water structure, and so they performed a bunch of other uh, functions. They were used for drinking water for livestock. Uh, there was usually fisheries associated with, with it. Um, and uh, the silt was sometimes desilted and used and put back in farms and so on. Now, the peculiar structure of these, and this is a structure of Ulsur uh, Lake. I found this picture on the internet in 1882. And you can see it's a much, it's urbanizing but still relatively rural kind of situation. Ulsur Lake is now bang in the middle of Bangor City. Um, and you can see that it's being used for a whole range of purposes. Um, a few of the tanks, while most tanks were irrigation tanks, a few of them, and Sankey Tank in Bangalore, uh, was built primarily for drinking water. So one of the early tanks that was built to supply uh, the, colonial, uh, the colonial, uh, the, the British colony of the colonial area. Um, now, what do we mean by multiple lakes? And, and so the first thing to understand is that these lakes, these tanks, were, these embankments were built on uh, the stream channels. And they were built on the stream channel and there would be basically an urban embankment. This was the speeder channel. Uh, the sluices were here which fed the downstream area, but then there would be a spillway and the spillway would come back and join the original stream channel and then onto the next lake and onto the <coughs> next lake and so on. So this is what we call a cascading tank chain, right? The water goes from one to the next to the next to the next. If this tank fills up, it cascades to the next, into the next, into the next, all the way to the end of the chain. Um, the interesting thing about this kind of structure or this kind of design is that these, these tanks performed 
multiple functions. In a sense, they were physical structures, they were engineering structures. But if you think about it on a very, very large scale, they also sort of acted like a water rights system. So in a sense, every village got to hold so much water and no more. And that village used that much water. Now, within the village, it was not used very equitably. There was definitely upper caste people in the time who, were, who got the irrigation, lower caste people who were away from the village and didn't have access to irrigation. So by no means was it equitable within the village. But if you look at it as at the large scale of the basin, every village got a certain amount and no more. So there was no way to take more than your share. That's all that you got. And so in a way, across the basin, it kind of divided the water up evenly, right? Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, a story and I'm going to work my way towards Bangalore's lakes, but I'm actually going to tell you the story of lakes outside Bangalore first. And the reason I'm doing this is because we've spent a lot of time studying these lakes. We've spent almost five years with 50 researchers studying these lakes. So this is a much more, uh, this portion of it is a much more heavy scientific study. But um, uh, So I'm, I'll spend a little bit of time just telling you the high level story before I come to Bangalore's lakes. So, what is the story of the Perigaman Lake? So, firstly, I told you that Bangalore's lakes have a problem. I showed you all those terrible pictures. But if you look at the Perigaman lakes, really different lakes have different problems. It's not the same problem in every single uh, lake. So, upstream, what we see is a, a story of drying. So, the lakes upstream of Bangalore have shown a continuous and statistically significant drying trend. Right? And so, that's a story of water disappearing. The lakes downstream of Bangalore show the opposite trend. They've been, if you look at satellite imagery, they've been getting wetter and wetter. The area looks lusher and lusher, but it's also polluted water. So long and short of it is, downstream, the area gets all the Bangalore sewage. And so the lakes are all filling up because the sewage is being discharged into the stream channels and it's filling up these lakes. So there are lots of lakes which are permanently full, but they're permanently full of sewage. And upstream, we have the opposite problem of the lake drying. Now, I'll start with the upstream story, which is the story of the upper Kavadi catchment. So this is Bangalore city, okay? And this watershed here, which is uh, what I'm going to call the upper Kavadi catchment, ends in this reservoir, which was once the major source of water to Bangalore. So Tijali Reservoir was built in the 1930s to have a capacity of about, to supply about 140, 48 million liters per day to Bangalore. Today it supplies zero. Right? It's completely dried up, it gets a little bit of water, mostly sewage at this point, but, but right now basically it doesn't get any water. Um, Hesukata Tank was built actually in the late 1800s and also uh, originally a water supply of Bangalore and it also hasn't supplied any water to Bangalore for 30 years and that's because it hasn't filled for 30 years. So clearly it's not a story of one or two tanks, but if you look at the satellite imagery, all the tanks are drying up. And so clearly there's something very big going on which is making the water disappear, right? Um, downstream, which is here, which is what I'm going to call the Vishwati catchment, ends in this big tank here, which is called Vaidamangla Reservoir, which is the picture here. And here is the story of the polluted, the pollution story that I'm going to tell. So let's quickly show you the upstream story. So what we did when we started this research about now five years ago, was we wanted to see why are the streams and why, why the streams and reservoir, why are the streams and tanks drying upstream. And what we did is we said, let's put every possible reason this could be happening. Could it be happening because it's raining less, because it's getting hotter, because we're putting in a lot of eucalyptus plantations and that's, eucalyptus is known to be a water guzzling plantation crop. Could it be that that's drying it up? Or could it be that farmers are pumping so much water that the groundwater is drying up? And what happens with, with groundwater is that when groundwater dries up, it sucks the stream dry, right? So one thing that I want to make sure for people who are not uh, water experts or at least hydrology experts is that there is actually no difference between ground and surface water. They are perfectly connected resources. In the sense, we try to think, we tend to think of this as a groundwater series, this is a surface water series. But actually, ground and surface water. I mean, nature doesn't distinguish. If you if you have groundwater, it's going to and the groundwater level rises up, rises up, it's going to seep into the stream. If you have a surface water stream and you have an empty reservoir, an, an empty aquifer under it, that surface water is going to sink into the into the aquifer and it's going to seep in and reach out groundwater. So they, they constantly feeding each other, right? So the, the hypothesis we had was perhaps because we had overexploited groundwater, where the groundwater used to traditionally feed the stream, in fact it was now the opposite, that the groundwater table had gone down all the way and now the stream was feeding groundwater. And so these were our four hypotheses. 
Now, very early on, we were able to establish that it wasn't the climate variable. And so, I'm not going to get into climate change and whether climate change is significant, but the point is that the 90% decline that we were seeing in stream flow decline in the upper country could not possibly be explained by this. And we looked at every possible statistical measure, uh, total rainfall, rainfall intensity, number of rainy days, everything, and it couldn't explain the kinds of disappearance of water that we were seeing. It had to be something else. So, um, without getting into the science and the measurement, basically, we spent five years measuring everything that we possibly could. So we did uh, satellite analysis, we measured groundwater, we measured surface water, we measured soil moisture, we did land use analysis, we, all kinds of stuff that scientists usually do. But the long and short of it is, this is sort of the, the story that evolved and uh, from that. So if you looked at what was happening to this TGLE catchment in 1975, okay, about 800 and everything, all the numbers here are in millimeters per year and they apply to the entire catchment. Uh, so if, a catch, if TGLE was getting 880 uh, millimeters in 1975, it did in that year, um, most of the water was being used up, was about 10% of it was running off and by run off, I mean stream flow into the reservoir downstream. So about 10% of that was ending up in TGLE catchment. The rest of it was going into rainfed agriculture, uh, some of it was recharging groundwater, but then the groundwater was feeding the stream flow again. Some of it there was a little bit of paddy, irrigated paddy agriculture, right? By 1999, the Borwell Revolution had started. So one of the big things that happened uh, in the late 70s was that Borwell's drilling technology became really cheap. And when drilling technology became cheap, suddenly all these farmers who had to cooperate around the opening and closing of those Lewis states were now completely liberated. Right? And so, very early on, electricity was given free, and it was given free by the government in order to encourage crowd development, right? And so they made electricity free, and then mobile technology really dropped. So the first thing that happened, and the most logical thing that happened, was that every farmer said, why on earth would we sit and cooperate and try to coordinate the opening and closing of these first states, which doesn't actually allow us to grow anything other than paddy. And at the end of the day, paddy is not a very remunerative crop. So it makes much more sense if we just think of sink in a board well and grow whatever we want and pump whenever we want. I mean, that's the most logical thing for any farmer to do. But the net result of that was with all of that groundwater, by 1999, all of our analysis showed that base flow had completely disappeared. That means the part of groundwater that was feeding the stream completely disappeared by the mid-1990s. That's what the evidence shows. And so where did all that water go? Well, some of it was now going into eucalyptus plantations because farmers had begun to put eucalyptus. And I should add here that eucalyptus was heavily promoted by the government in the early, in the 80s as a social policy project. So it was one of those, uh, the big government, uh, a market project by the government of Karnataka uh, under a World Bank funded scheme. So the first thing they did was they put a bunch of eucalyptus. A lot of explosion of paddy and sugarcane it happened in the 1990s. Suddenly everybody could grow whatever they wanted. You didn't have to live in the command area. You had electricity 24 hours a day, board wells were cheap, so everybody was pumping continuously. With the result that, um, with the result that ground, oops, sorry, groundwater tables began to fall, and uh, a lot of the rain that was coming, very, you can see that when 10% of the rain was running off into TGLA reservoir, suddenly that dropped to a fifth by the mid 1990s. Oops, sorry about that. And and then by 2010, that just further intensified. So uh, what we found was that. Farmers were growing more and more. There was more and more bore wells, and more, uh, and and more and more of the rain was being de dedicated to irrigated agriculture and eucalyptus, and less of it, and actually virtually zero was running off downstream to the river. Right. So long and short of it, the story upstream is a story of a lot of rural India, where uh, rivers and streams are drying primarily because of groundwater over exploitation driven by free electricity. Free electricity. Right? And in case it be construed and misconstrued, I'm not blaming any blaming the farmers here. They're doing what is most uh, rational and noble for them. But we can do a lot better, and we can. That's a separate conversation. Um, the only other point that I would like to drive uh, here is that these changes happen partly because of technology change. That modern technology became cheap, partly because of policy change, because government gave free electricity. But it also happened because of markets. So what happened is, when you have a city like Bangalore, where people have uh, are willing to pay for exotic vegetables and 
It's also a big uh, uh, a labor market center. A lot of the farm, it makes no sense to be a rainfed farmer near Bangalore. Because if you're a rainfed farmer near Bangalore, you're earning 30,000 rupees a month per acre and about an acre, acre and a half is an average land holding size. If you put your land under eucalyptus and go and work in the city, you're earning 50 as a driver or as a painter or as, as, a, as a wage laborer, you're earning 10,000 rupees a month as a, a month, which is 1,20,000 a year, is what you're earning. There's no uncertainty, there's no crop, there's no pest, there's no agricultural input. That's what you're getting as salary. And you haven't sold your land, you're still getting your return from your land as well. And so, if you really want to talk about what do we do about the rural side of the, the drying story, which is uh, the story of upstream Bangalore, is the story of all of rural India. And this pattern is not only true of Bangalore, we've seen this repeatedly in upstream of every big city. The city basically acts as a suck, it creates a market for jobs, it creates a market for commodities. It forces everybody to either choose, either you, if you're a rain fed farmer, you're going to quit and go and work in the city and do something else. If you're, or you're going to irrigate and irrigate to grow something that you can really become a commercial farmer, you're not going to be a subsistence rain fed farmer. Right, so this is the story of the upstream, the upstream story. Now downstream was a very, very different story. Downstream of Bangalore, so this is Bangalore again, and this is that Ishbakti catchment that I talked about. This work was done by my colleague Priyanka Jamwal, who runs the entry uh, water and soil quality lab. Uh, and what she did was, she found the usual sewage story, which I mean, of course, the Rishwati was not a river anymore. It carries mostly sewage, but I'm going to talk about sewage at length later. So the main story there was that what was actually entering this reservoir, the Bairamangala reservoir, was a mixture of sewage and industrial effluent. So the problem is not so much that there's sewage going down and farmers are using the sewage. Sewage contains nutrients, which is not terrible. I mean, it, called, you know, it has been, causes rashes and so on. By itself, it's not the end of the world. But what they found was that there's this industrial area in Bangalore. And the industrial areas were releasing unregulated effluents. And the story there was that the, unre so the unregulated effluents were being released mainly at night. So what, what Priyanka did, which was different from what the Pollution Control Board was doing or what anyone else was doing, was that she did 24 hour sampling. And what she found was the Pollution Control Board was always doing rat sampling during the day. The industries were always releasing at night. And so you had this story of continuous heavy metals and she found high levels of chromium uh, and manganese. Uh, in, in the in the water, that was basically ending up in the in, in the reservoir, and it was actually showing up in uh, fodder samples, milk samples, and vegetables, and it was coming back to the city. So, in in other words, our food chain was being contaminated because of what was happening with industrial effluent and uh, with lack. And I want to say lack of regulation, but it's a much more complicated story. So, if you ask the question of uh, the Perry urban story, it's really a story of drying upstream and horrible industrial pollution which is unregulated downstream. And that's not an easy problem to solve because it involves corruption, it involves the structuring of the, uh, of the pollution control board, it involves the nature of sampling, uh, the lack of detectability of the pollution. So the fact is that we eat vegetables and milk that we don't know and we don't know what they contain because it's not observable in either the taste or you know, the look of the vegetables and milk. So, so there isn't a big protest of Bangaloreans kind of rising up in arms to, to say uh, what's in our, our, our milk and what's in our vegetables. So I'm going to kind of stop there with the periurban story and kind of move <coughs> to the story of Bangalore's lakes, which is what today's talk was really going to be about. So let me start with what's happening within Bangalore. So I'll, I'll walk you through it a little bit because it's a little complicated. So this is Bangalore city again. And if you're in Bangalore and you or you've seen a map of Bangalore, right in the middle of the city, you might have noticed something called a High Grounds Police Station. And High Grounds Police Station is called High Grounds Police Station because it's at a height, right? It's at, Bangalore's actually at the top of the mountain. And that's different from most other cities which are located at the bottom of a mountain, which is in a valley along the river. So most cities, as you can think about Chennai, whether you want to think about Kanpur, you want to think about Delhi, they're always on the banks of a major river, right? The banks of the Yamuna, the banks of the Ganga. And so Bangalore is actually different in this. It was actually a hill station, but actually literally at the top of a mountain. Now what happens when you have a city that's at the top of a mountain? So firstly, you can see that it, can, it actually gets divided into three different watersheds. Okay, and this is a watershed. What does that mean? So when you rain on the top of a mountain, 
the water that's on, so it's your mountain like this and it rains on it, the water that's on this side is going to run off this way, the water that's on this side is going to run off like this way. So mountains are watershed divides. They, they split the rainfall into different directions, right? And that's exactly what Bangalore does. It splits the rainfall, though any water that comes here flows off that way, so I can show you that. So the water that, it actually consists of three distinct valleys or three distinct sub-watersheds. The first one is the Hebal Valley. So any water that falls here kind of goes through this tank cascade and comes out here. Any water that comes here is rains here, is going to go through this cascade of tanks and comes out here. And these two actually meet to go to form the Dakshin Pinakini River, which goes to Tamil Nadu. And then oops, any water that's here is going to fall, go to the Rishbavati and then to the Vairamanya that I just showed you. And that's actually a tributary of the Rishbavati joins the Argavati, which joins the Kaveri. So basically, it goes to the Kaveri and then to Tamil Nadu. Okay? So the long and short of it, I mean, what I wanted you to get out of it is that. When we talk about Bangalore's lakes, it's actually different series or different chains, different cascades. There are multiple cascades. And so, sort of different things happen in different cascades, but that's a different story. Okay, so what are the problems with Bangalore? So, the first thing that, which happened with Bangalore is, like I said, many of these uh, lakes were irrigation tanks. They were seasonal irrigation tanks. So, they were, you know, that's the way irrigation tanks are. They kind of fill up when it rains and then they're dry for a large chunk of the year. As the city developed, there were a lot of people who looked at the land and said, look at all that empty land and it's not doing anything for most of the year, so why don't we just convert it? And some of Bangalore's big, big iconic landmarks were actually built on the beds of these tanks. So they basically said, that land's useless, let's give it for some development or the other, so Majestic Bus Terminus, Country Bus Stadium, and the list is very, very long. But, uh, and in private developers as well. But a lot of what happened in the early phases was outright conversion of lake land to develop, for development purposes. Now, as the second problem, which is really, and I have to say that the encroachment problem is a problem, is still a problem, but I think we've reached the point that citizen groups are vigilant enough uh, that I don't think it's going to be a problem. That is not going to be the problem in the future. Every now and then the government will try and be notified, but there's, you know, lawsuits are fine. There's certainly a lot of vigilance around that. So I would say it's a problem in the past, but it's not the main problem at the moment. What's the main problem at the moment? The main problem at the moment is that Bangalore has had this phenomenal population growth. And you can see the population is, has doubled every couple of decades. Oh. So it's exponentially increasing, right? And what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that the sewage treatment capacity, both the sewerage as well as the sewage treatment capacity, have not kept pace with the growth in the city. Now, when people migrate to the city, they are going to bathe and wash and poop every day. I mean, that's that's the nature of human uh, existence. They're not going to stop doing any of those things. So as long as you have population growth, you're going to have sewage being generated in a city. And so what happened was they were doing pretty well. So if you look at the actual sewage treatment capacity versus what was needed, and I came up with a rough estimate of what might be needed with different populations, and you can see that in the 80s, between the 60s and 80s, they built two really big sewage treatment plants. So they did pretty well by 1980. And then by 2000 at present, it started lagging behind. So the main thing that happened is that the city grew so fast that the sewage system and the sewage treatment, or the sewage treatment plant capacity did not keep pace with it. Okay? So that's a pretty simple story. And the problem is even the existing capacity is not being used to its full, uh, to its full, uh, even the existing sewage treatment plants are not running at full capacity. And that's because the sewerage uh, network and the sewage treatment plants aren't perfectly aligned with each other. So there's lots of place, the places where you have sewage treatment plants but the sewerage hasn't been put in. So the sewerage doesn't actually get, the sewage doesn't actually get to the sewage treatment plant. And there are other places where it's the other way. That you, you have the sewerage network but there's no sewage treatment plant, it just comes and ends up in some way. Right? Or a drain. So it's basically there's all the addition to being under capacity, there's also a misalignment of development of the sewage network and the sewage treatment capacity. As a result of which, almost two thirds of the city's current uh, sewage that's being generated is actually untreated. And a relatively small fraction of a third is being treated. A very, very small amount is actually being treated sufficiently to be reused. Right? And so, not surprisingly, you have a problem where Bangalore's rivers what used to be the rivers, are actually open drains. Not very different. The story isn't any very different in most cities in India. Right? Most cities in India, what we call a river is actually a drain. And so this is what you know the Bangalore's quote-unquote rivers are look like. 
Now, I don't know if you can see that. So what is the result of all of that sewage being in, in the drain? Well, it means that you're going to have a lake uh, which is going to be full of sewage. Now, this is a picture taken at night. I didn't realize how blurred it was. But it's really a picture of Bhartur Lake which is both on fire and forming at the same time. So if you have massive, massive quantities of raw sewage entering lakes, terrible things are going to happen. You're going to have water hyacinth blooms, you're going to have terrible amounts of foaming, uh, it's going to smell every now and then, the combination of all of that is going to release methane and you're going to add solid waste to it and it's going to catch fire. And all of these things happen, right? Um, the cause is not that, it's not really that, it's not rocket science. It's raw sewage. Now, uh, we don't, I'm not sure we've actually understood exactly what the cause of the foaming is, but I've been told by my colleagues that it's possibly because of the nature of filamentous bacteria and so on, which exist in raw sewage, but uh, I think that's still being debated. Um, so what, are we, what, what is the current solution? So clearly the city's grown too fast, the sewage network's not been grown, it has not grown, kept pace. And so you have a bunch of open drains, and they're all emptying into these lakes, and the lakes are catching fire, right? So, so what do you do about it? So currently, one of the main things to do uh, that the government does at the moment is what's called diversion, right? So what they do is, there's a drain here, and this is a drain which is full of sewage. And what they'll do is they'll basically not, they'll just block the entrance of that drain. In, the drain was the original river channel. They just won't let it enter the lake. So it's not going to enter the lake, it's just going to continue on downstream, okay? So what's going to happen when you do this? Well, two things are going to happen because that drain is carrying not only the sewage, it's carrying the sewage as well as the storm water that, that would get into the drain when it rains, right? So now you've sort of had what I would call throw, throwing the baby out with the the, the baby out with the bath water or the sewage water uh, as a mere word, but basically that means you have neither sewage nor storm water entering the lake and all you have is a dry lake, which you can see is the case with this particular lake which is Sound Cave in Bangalore. Um, it also has a second effect that it's going to accumulate. So where you had only a trickle of sewage in the city center, as you keep diverting the, all of the drains around every, every lake in the chain, you're just going to have bigger and bigger and bigger drains carrying more and more and more and more sewage. By the time you go to the end of the lake, and in the ends of the, the, the two recipient lakes in the Bangalore chains are Bhartur and Bellendu. By the time you get that, you're getting hundreds of millions of liters of essentially raw sewage every day. And then when it rains, the storm water is added to that. And so you just have these massive frothing problems as well as uh, raw sewage. And so this is Salkeda okay again. So when you have both sewage and storm water, you're going to get a dry lake. So you have a bunch of lakes. If you just look at the Google Earth image of Bangalore, there's a bunch of lakes. And no matter what season of the year they are, it's always going to be dry. And so this is the reason, right? OK, the second solution. That's there in very few, a handful of um, uh, in a handful of lakes in Bangalore is to build what's called a lake size lakeside sewage treatment plant. So what you do is you instead you you either have a sewage treatment plant, uh, you either connect the sewage network to a sewage treatment plant, and then the, the treated water is dumped into the lake. So the lake is at least getting somewhat treated water, or you pick water from the drain itself and treat it. Even if you haven't built out the sewage network and you dump that into the lake. And without getting into the complications of the, the implications of that, what you get is actually lakes which look pretty decent. So this is Chakpur Lake in Manu where we worked for a very long time with a lot of data collection here. And you, this gets about 10 million liters per day. It actually looks very nice. Chakpur is really often touted as being an exemplary example of lake management in Bangalore. It has a very, very strong citizen group. They do an amazing job. It looks really good, you know, 100 pelicans on the bird island. It's a beautiful birding paradise. There's a small wrinkle to this story, which is that when you actually do uh, measurements of water quality in the lake, even Jakur Lake, which is beautiful, I mean, it's not, it doesn't have dead fish, it has lots of birds, even Jakur Lake is still hypoeutrophic. That means it still is getting too much of nitrates and phosphates. So sewage treatment plants typically don't scrub out nitrates and phosphates from your sewage. They're really taking out the, the organic matter, the poop out of, out of it. And you're still going to have a lot of nitrates and phosphates. So what, do, what do those do? They basically allow a lot of algal blooms because when you have water and you have lots of nutrients, algae and bacteria and stuff are going to love that nutrient soup and they're going to grow. Right? And what do they do? When you have algae growing in lakes, 
you have these huge fluctuations of dissolved oxygen in the lake. So what happens is you have a bunch of algae, they are enjoying all of those nutrients you put in the lake. During the day, they are going to photosynthesize. So they are going to release oxygen, right? They are going to take in carbon dioxide and release oxygen. So you have these huge increases in dissolved oxygen. Actually, these are super saturated conditions during the day. But during the early morning hours, the algae are doing exactly the opposite. So they are uh, respiring instead of photosynthesizing. And now suddenly they are sucking all of the oxygen out of the lake. You have these sudden crashes. So wherever you look, you see in Bangalore where the new, this is work done by my colleague Priyanka Jambal. So wherever you have um, lakes in Bangalore where you see these sudden fish kills, they almost inevitably happen in the early morning hours when the lakes are basically, uh, when all the algae are basically respiring, right? So the point that I was making from this whole thing is that even though you have lakes which look clean, they don't smell, they are pretty good most of the time, they still have problems because they are not exactly optimized to, to support biodiversity. And so basically the long and short of it is even here you still need to do more. I mean it's not good enough to just do that secondary treatment, you really, we need to be figuring out ways of scrubbing those nutrients even more. And so there's a lot of groups in Bangalore which are experimenting with constructed wetlands, floating wetlands, improving uh, treatment capacity of the sewage treatment plants itself. But I think it's a it's a whole evolving story. It's not a complete, it's, it's an ongoing story. Okay, so the long and short of this entire bit is that if I had to summarize the entire problem with Bangalore's lakes, it's that the city's grown too fast, there's too much sewage, the sewage is mixed with stormwater in the trains, and no matter what we do around the sites, and no matter how much we, uh, you know, citizens mobilize and so on, you're not entirely going to solve the problem unless you treat that sewage, right? And so that has to be kind of a part of any solution going forward. That being said, that still remains a block problem. I just want to put this up here to show you that it's a non-trivial job to do this because there are multiple agencies handling every lake. Uh, the BBMP, which is the municipal corporation, owns a bunch of lakes. The Bangalore Development Authority has, an, has control of another bunch. So even within a chain, you can have different ownerships of different lakes. Uh, they all work in silos. The water supply and sewerage board manages the sewage. The stormwater drains are managed by the municipal corporation. The pollution control board does the testing. Uh, the lake development authority does, we can't figure out exactly what they do. And the fish, fisheries department, um, <coughs> They do some of the initial rejuvenation stuff, but I think it's an evolving board. And then the fisheries department actually gives out the fisheries contracts and controls the fishermen. So really it's this problem of fragmented authority. It's non-trivial, even with all of that. We know that the problem is fixed and sewage, but it's still a still problem too. And we haven't actually done um, a comprehensive sewage planning. We don't have a comprehensive sewage plan in the city. So I think it's really difficult for everybody to get behind the same, the, the same plan. So there's been tremendous engagement of citizens groups in the city's lakes and we've been trying to work on creating a citizen dashboard hoping that even if the agencies are fragmented, if there is citizen action around them, can we give them informed information so that they can kind of take the measurements that we do both on the BOD. We empower, we both interpret that it, its data isn't enough by itself. We can go and put a bunch of sensors in lakes. But we also need to go and get that data interpreted, tell them kind of what it means in terms of a decision pathway and then empower them to go and uh, talk to the various agencies and bring them. And I, I think a lot of citizen groups and Jabu Lake in particular, they do a really good job of bringing agencies together. They kind of act as that, that coordinating agency. So I am still hopeful even though, uh, despite everything else I've said. Um, the second place that citizen groups I feel have actually had a positive impact and I'm saying this because I don't want people to get disappointed by thinking the problem is too big and they don't have a role to play. But the second place I feel that citizen groups have actually done a good job is on the cultural side, um, which is with idle immersion. So uh, one of the big functions of lakes is cultural. We can't kind of pretend that organized religion is going to stop mattering to people. And so this is the problem during every Durga Puja and every Ganesh uh, in Bangalore. And so one of the things I've seen the more effective, firstly you can see that this is not in the main lake. And I think most uh, citizen groups have been quite vigilant in kind of being able to ensure that the emergence happen in this is called a Kalyani. This is sort of the, the temple tank which has been set aside and they usually set aside a little land aside on the side of the lake which doesn't interact with the main lake and say idle immersion has to happen only there. Some of them do a really good job of policing. Some of them 
uh, and Jappu Lake has been again a great example of spending months ahead of the festival, kind of educating and reaching out to communities, saying oh. mud only, you know, no paints, no plaster Paris, that sort of thing. Really regulating traffic, kind of separating out and making sure that the solid waste is completely removed. And that, when you speak to them, it really, it's really a non-trivial thing because it really involves engaging with people in a very respectful way where you're kind of telling them your solid waste is not going to landfill, we're going to kind of give it back to nature and kind of dealing with that solid waste in a very sensitive way so that communities start feeling motivated. So I don't want to minimize the role that citizen groups play in doing this piece of it. I still think that they do an amazing, tremendous job. Okay, so the part of the story so far has been, you know, sewage is the big problem and we need to fix the sewage. And I think the, the last piece, and I'm hoping 10 minutes more, yeah. So the last piece uh, that I want to talk about is where do lakes fit in is as part of the entire urban water story. And the reason this is important is that we let's say that you know sewage treatment is fixed. And sewage treatment is not that impossible to fix. So I don't know if many of you know that London, the Thames in London was actually a sewer, pretty much an open drain like many of Bangalore's uh, drains in the 1960s. And basically they fixed the problem by building a bunch of sewage treatment plants. So it's not an unfixable problem, right? Uh, it's technology we know how to do it. And of course, to some extent, we need to wait for the city to kind of stabilize a little bit. Part of the problem is no agency can keep up with the insane growth. But leaving that aside, in the future, it's fixable. The question is, what should we do with that switch? So here, I want to talk about how we think about urban water and the role of lakes within that conceptualization of urban water. So if you look at the newspaper articles, in like various Bangalore newspapers, there are what I would call two competing visions. I would call them the linear water economy vision and the circular water economy vision. And I'm going to explain in a minute what I mean by that. So there's a bunch of people who think that our job with as utilities and much of the Western world, which is what is so you know what a rich act uh, behaves in this way. So you get water from some pristine source, which is far away which is relatively unpolluted, relatively untouched. I really like that, you know, Bombay gets from the Western Ghats, which is nice, clean, clean environment. You bring it to water treat, treat utility and you treat it, chlorinate it, whatever else you do. You pipe it to consumers. The consumers generate wastewater, which goes to a sewage treatment plant. The sewage treatment plant then treats that water to a uh, reasonable quality, whatever that is, depending on what the recipient is receiving water body is, and it discharges it to some other water body down here. This is kind of what I would call a linear water economy. And most of our conceptualization of urban water supply, including in Bombay, is, is this, that you basically get water at one end and you spew it out at the other end, right? And if you had to kind of do calculation, and don't worry about the numbers and sizes, but if you have, this is kind of called, you know, flow diagram of uh, water and wastewater. Uh, if you had to do a calculation of this, you would kind of, in Bangalore, say, you'd get water from the Kaveri, Bangalore Water Supply and Sewerage Board would give it to domestic and commercial consumers. They would all be uh, serviced with a sewage treatment uh, sewage network that would go to a treatment plant and be perfectly treated, and then it would go downstream and flow into the ground, right? And then separately, completely separately from the system, lakes would get water for directly from the rain, uh, and some of the water would go via lakes, some of it would evaporate and, and disappear, and then stormwater would also go downstream. So this is kind of you know all these streams are completely separate; they're not kind of intermixed in any way. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, that's not at all what a typical water supply is most Indian towns. It's not so much in Bombay because I think Bombay doesn't have uh, either downstream. It has very high rainfall, so Bombay, Bombay is exceptional in many ways. But most other cities in India have a much more messy kind of economy, uh, water supply system. So you will get water from a surface water utility. It will be, it will go to utility and it will reach a consumer. But often this water will be highly, uh, this pipe system will be highly leaky and some of that will go and leak back into the aquifer below. Typically, the water that the pipe supply su supplies is never enough and most consumers are getting water through tankers or directly from the groundwater aquifer via their own bore wells. They are generating wastewater, some of it's going to the sewage treatment plant, some of it's going directly to lakes like we saw in Bangalore. The sewage treatment plant is an addition feeding lakes the lakes are then not just sitting there, they are actually recharging groundwater back. And so the lakes are kind of, the water from the lakes is actually going back to groundwater. And then, yeah, rainwater is also feeding groundwater, rainwater is also feeding the lakes. It's much more mixed. 
right? And so, and so these are numbers that we've actually done from calculations with uh, for bank loan. Take the numbers with a pinch of salt because we are still trying to kind of finalize them. But this is what it really looks like. You have all of these loops. You have treated and untreated waste water. But the only, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of numbers um, in this Sankey diagram. It's called a Sankey diagram. A couple of numbers. One of this is what's happening with lakes here. And lakes is kind of this thing. So lakes kind of send a bunch of water back to groundwater, right? Because they recharge through the lake bed. They also evaporate a bunch of water which just goes into the atmosphere. And those numbers are actually roughly of the same order, which means that every million liters of, that you get from a recharge, a lake's recharging groundwater, you're going to lose one million as evaporation. Now, why is this important? This is important because often at the basin scale, people had not thought of lake's evaporation being significant at all. I mean, it's not something that was thought of as being a legitimate use of water in the basin. But it's important and I'm sure all of you know how contentious it is. The only reason I'm bringing these kind of complicated things up, and I know that this is tiring and exhausting to look at, is that sometimes we miss these hidden linkages. And that's where the science kind of really comes in, to say we really need to figure out from the modelings and from data how much is going where, because those numbers that we see from all these pieces, uh, evapor evaporation, evapotranspiration is a big, big number. Uh, and we just forget about that. So I think it's really important to keep that at the back of your mind while we are kind of um, why are we kind of thinking about how we think about this uh, loop water economy? Now, the question is, is the storage that we have in Bangalore enough, right? And I just want to draw your attention to some numbers. 1350, this is million liters per day, and 750 million liters per day from groundwater, 1350 million liters per day from the Kaveri is what Bangalore gets, right? It generates about 1700 million liters per day of wastewater. The amount of storage that is there in all of the lakes put together, and this number is very, very inaccurate because we've not measured everything. We've done bathymetry studies and assume and extrapolated them, so take it with a pinch of salt, is somewhere between 30 to 40 days of storage, right? Now, typically when we're talking about reservoir storage for a reliable reservoir storage, engineers are thinking about a year of storage as being reasonable. They're not thinking about 30 days. So 30 days is not going to get you across. So clearly we can't entirely rely on lakes as being our storage system. Right? But the key thing to remember in this whole story is that the difference between your traditional reservoirs is that it rains only three to three months a year. Your reservoir needs to store that water and have that supply in the entire year. The difference with lake with the sewage going into lakes, you know, treated sewage going into lakes and you're using it back, which is what the circular water economy is that sewage is being generated every single day. So you don't need a year of storage because every day you know, 1700 ml is being generated, that's going into the lakes. The lakes are able to provide some kind of buffer and then you're able to use it back. Some of it goes into groundwater, some of it comes back into your pipe system. And so I would argue that just by the numbers, it's not completely a pipe dream, right? It's actually possible that you could have cities in the future that are able to recirculate their water over and over. Because the thing to remember, which is important in this whole thing, is that cities don't use the water consumptively. That means if you use 100 liters per capita per day, 80 liters of that is going to go back as wastewater. So as long as you can figure out the wastewater side of it, there is a chance that you can loop this around, right? Now, and having said that, I think that it's important, or my colleague at least would, uh, Priyanka would complain if I didn't make this caveat, which is that we haven't figured out what's in our water yet. There are emerging contaminants. We're still kind of thinking that we live in the 18th century and the only thing we have is fecal coliform and, and poop and nothing else. But clearly, uh, there's all kinds of garbage in our water, which has which we don't know how to deal with. Our sewage treatment plants don't know how to deal with. We don't know what they're doing. We don't know what impact they have. And so if you're going to circulate the water forever and ever in the same system, those are going to accumulate over time. So there is an issue to be thought about, about how we deal with this through our sewage treatment system. I don't want to oversell the idea of a circular water economy. There are kind of still a lot of things we don't know. Um, but I think that, I, I still think that there's, the, that have, you know, we spend the time thinking about this and we spend the time thinking about what we are exactly doing with our wastewater. We have, we'll figure out a way to figure all of this out. Um, I didn't want you to read these list of chemicals because, you know, there's so many hundreds of them that they found through this passive sampling approach, but it includes things like AIDS drugs and all kinds of other, you know, antidepressant drugs, antibiotics, I mean, all kinds of stuff. 
So terrible things that we don't know what we're doing. Okay? And it's there both in secondary or I think I the long yeah. Let's get that. Now I'm going to end on this final note, which is about having imagination. So what do we do at the moment? If you really step back and think about how our cities are designed, what we are doing is really insane because what we are doing is we grow food in farms and we are depleting the farms of nutrients in the process of doing that. We eat that food and we generate a whole bunch of organic waste. We mix it with our non-biodegradable waste and it goes to landfill. At the same, so that's our, our, our uh, and then some of that leaches into our, our water supply system. Some of it goes in, uh, some of that food goes in through our poop into the sewage treatment plant and then ends up there. So we basically continuously deplete our, uh, our farms of, of nutrients and we continuously pollute our water bodies as well as our landfills through the, the waste that we generate. On the water side, what we do is equally ridiculous. We are often getting water from a distant source, increasingly distant sources, and sometimes by mining groundwater. We are taking it to, a, to, to the consumer and then uh, generating wastewater, which goes to a sewage treatment plant, that we again dump into our water bodies that either goes eventually into the sea or pollutes them, either way. But either way, it's this continuous one-way movement. Now imagine if we, and, and the reason we did this is in the 18th century when people designed cities like this, they didn't know any other way. The best way they could uh, solve cholera and typhoid was to get the poop out of the city as fast as possible and not have to think about it anymore. But now we're kind of stuck in this infrastructure because that's the only way we think about urban water. Uh, we're stuck in this situation where we now have to consume sufficient amount of water just to move that solid stuff through pipes. So we can't actually tomorrow say that we'll all use uh, you know, water efficient shower heads and water efficient taps. We would still have a problem with your sewage system getting locked up with a bunch of sewage. So we would still have a problem even if um, So we would still have a problem with, with our sewage system getting locked up. So we are stuck in this, uh, we, are, we are kind of uh, forced to be in this technology where forever and ever we've got to supply people 100 liters per capita per day just to, just to move it up, move it through the system. Now, imagine if we were able to completely rethink our, our system where, and I'm, now I'm thinking about really futuristic, okay? This is, these technologies exist, but we're very, very, very far away from them. And I'm just trying to think about how would we think about a city 100 years from now? And imagine if every morning, instead of putting out um, garbage and instead of putting out a you know, sewage from your sewer, you put out compost bins which consists of your uh, solid waste, organic solid waste and your partially treated uh, poop, basically. And imagine that fertilizer was going back to farm somehow. Now you imagine what this kind of an ecosystem would do. Instead of moving your nutrients continuously from one end to the other, you kind of looped it back, right? And these technologies individually exist. They also make more sense in a, from an energy perspective. So right now, composting technology, I found this online, apparently it costs 900 it exists, not the most well-defined thing, it has its own problems, I don't know if I would want to use one myself. But if you think about it, it's, it's really a cultural mindset of why do we have to flush, or why does it, I mean, we, we could have a perfectly beautifully designed toilet, which doesn't kind of take away from our experience in any way. But why do, why do we care about what happens at the back end? We shouldn't care, it's, that's just something that we culturally think of. Why couldn't we think about source segregation at the toilet level as well? instead of just at the solid base level. And if we did that, and there are toilets in ETH, ETH in Switzerland and so on have developed these so segregating toilets, then you suddenly have a system where you kind of remove the water from your poop. And most of the energy that we spend in our sewage treatment and wastewater side of it goes in firstly just moving that poop to a to, to, to treatment plant and then to run the sewage treatment plant. So we spend energy to move it, we spend energy to treat it again, right? Why if we switch this technology at the household scale. Then theoretically, and I don't know, I mean there's lots of pieces to this puzzle that still need to be fixed, but theoretically you could think about a future where we really are using that solid waste locally in the in building, we're using it for waste generation, I mean for energy generation, not for any, not so it becomes a net producer of energy just like over gas plants and so on, and instead of an energy consumer. Now we are not that far away from this technology as far as I know, 
And I'm not an expert in this subject at all. I just wanted to end in a reasonably futuristic. But from what I understand of the technology, we're not that far away from this technology being a reality. What we have is we have legacy systems that we are stuck in. And so I think that if I had to end, and this is particularly for the young people in this room, is to kind of figure out how do we get from this 18th century legacy system to an imagined 21st century legacy system, or 22nd century legacy system, if we are here to be for the 21st century. But a 22nd century legacy system, which is uh, not legacy system, a 22nd century circular system, which actually just makes sense. So we could go back to the whiteboard and design everything from scratch. Maybe we could do something completely different. And I could imagine suddenly where in Bangalore right now the people, the villages with the landfill are standing with guns. I mean, I like to imagine, have this visual that they'd be standing with guns. If you actually took, you know, you took manure back instead of sending mixed garbage, right? So in a sense, I don't, I, I'm, I'm deliberately ending in with this very fine sky kind of message saying, I think that there is, um, a lot of pieces, there is pieces for technology developers to do, there is pieces for VCs to do, there's pieces that for people, urban planners uh, to think about, and there's people for people who work in science and policy to think about all of this. But I really think that if we don't start talking about it now, we're not going to reach those kind of cities in another way. audience of people. I think we have a lot of students here as well as, uh, you know, we've been working on this issue of water and bringing uh, water issues to the public domain. And so it's very nice to see the network that you all are part of growing. Um, I want to thank Dr. Srinivasan for just opening our eyes to thinking of this ecosystem and thinking in a circular manner and not just in a linear manner. So um, I want to start with you and, uh, you know, welcome Professor Yajnik as well. Um, they are, of course, linked. Professor Yajnik was a professor at IIT, and uh, when uh, when Dr. Srinivasan was a student, and you know, good things happened. Although she made, she didn't take a class with him, she tells us, but um, they were in the same ecosystem. They were part of the circular economy. Let's try, let's put it in that in that way. So she was in the physics department. So I want to start off with a question for you, just um, you know, adding on to where you left off. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the citizens' groups and uh, are you as scientists or you at ATRI, are you trying to do some of that interface with citizens' groups and how is that working out? Yeah, no, we work very, very closely with citizen groups. So in a sense, I would firstly classify, there's almost like a hierarchy of citizen groups, right? There are people, citizen groups that work on one individual layer and they kind of live around that lake and they are concerned with that lake and often the local citizen groups are kind of more interested in the, the aesthetic aspect where they want to do fencing and they want to build a nice children's park and they want to have a yoga program and they love music programs and that sort of stuff. It's very, very community oriented which is great. Um, uh, and then there's a whole, what I would call, what in academic literature is often called boundary organizations where citizen groups are networks of citizen groups. So there are some citizen groups that are now in the last 10 years evolving where instead of working with a single lake, they work with groups of lakes uh, or chains of lakes and they interface very closely with us, with some of these individual citizen groups and with government agencies. And I think we, we interact with both. With the individual citizen groups, it's only on the lakes that actually have sensors and, and monitor, monitoring where we will kind of work with them and talk to them about what we found from the, from the data and, and that sort of thing. But, but I don't... I should say one of the ways we interact is on through WhatsApp, right? So every citizen group has a WhatsApp group. And these are very, very high mail volume WhatsApp groups, high message volume WhatsApp groups. So some of them will have 1,500 messages a day. And they're all about links. So one of the ways that we interface, and it's hard to keep up with because I feel, you know, do we want to do the science? But I feel sort of we need to be doing both. And so, so one of the ways we engage is through the WhatsApp groups. But with the networks, the net, what I call the boundary organizations, I think we work very closely with, with some of them where we will have more detailed meetings. They will come to us uh, often and tell us, well, the government is planning to do this. So one of the recent things that happened is the government is going to trans tra transfer all of Bangalore's lakes out of the control of the city to the minor irrigation department. And they asked us to come to that and you know, to respond to that, which we wrote a series of op-eds. Uh, right away, we also interfaced, had individual calls with each of them saying this makes no institutional sense to take what's essentially an urban 
set of links and then which has to do with sewage and, and park management and movement to minor irrigation department. So, so there are very concrete ways in which we interact. Sometimes they will come to us, sometimes we respond, respond through WhatsApp groups, sometimes we reach out to them saying there's an interesting thing for so, this. Yes. Um, often with um, science and then we begin with action, right? So here you have uh, you know physics and you have uh, you know the, the very detailed work of science that you need to be doing. Have you come across a situation where the science that you produced is not what the citizens groups want to hear? I mean, so in fact, there's a, they want to rally around, they want to be activists, they want to take the government to task, um, and they want to have scenarios that they, they you know, hold everybody accountable for. But you as scientists find yourself in this unenviable position of uh, you know, being um, in some ways ideologically on their side, but professionally you did not find that to be corroborated. Has that happened? Or yeah, so one example is with the, the hydroeutrophic lake, right? That was done with with a very, very successful lake, which has a very active citizen group. Now, uh, the citizens love the lake, and they don't want to hear that it's hydroeutrophic. Uh, to some extent, they don't necessarily perceive it, because only when fish actually die, do you know do we do they start getting worried about it. But they don't mind that green soupy look, and they feel as long as the birds are there, and you know, it's fine. And so I think that is a case where the data kind of uh, rely, they don't want to hear the, the water quality is in what it should be. So I think that's one of the cases where we, we get into that a little bit, uh, where they don't want to hear the truth. But, but I, we, we couch it very gently. I, think we, I mean, it's not their fault that the lake has. So in a sense, we, you have to play a little bit of a messaging game there. So I'll turn to then IIT, which is seen you know, as the like the highest echelon of science production, right, in some ways. And you're involved in physics, which is even like the, almost the purest form in that sense of being most removed from society. But um, how did you, in that sense, uh, you know, how did how did Pawai become such an important part of your imagination as a scientist? Yeah, so <clears throat> let me begin by thanking you firstly to invite me here. And uh, congratulations to uh, Veena for doing such fantastic work, which is really hard work. And she's really putting all the skills that IIT taught her, if I don't mind, <laughs> if you don't mind my saying so. Uh, and here, I'm here not as a physics professor, but wearing the hat of uh, alumnus of IIT, who lived in the IIT hostels for five years. And uh, the campus was much greener and the whole Hawaii uh, ecosystem was a picnic area in the 70s when we were students. And then 25 years later, uh, we find, I became a prof there later, but uh, all my friends find that the lake is in such a dire straits. So uh, we decided to do something about it. Uh, there is a bit of history to it in the sense that the campus community time and again did something. Uh, and sometimes I thought a bit emotionally in the sense that that formed a group who would get up at 5 a.m. and go and start uh, dragging water hyacinth from the lake. And I personally thought it was not a very productive approach because it just made more space for water hyacinth to grow faster, etc. But anyway, they did it, it gave them some satisfaction. But that is why when my friends were inquiring what we should do as our legacy project, uh, give back to the institute. Uh, this was one of the suggestions that maybe we could take up a scientific approach and maybe pull in some money that can actually help out the lake. So that is how we got onto the track of looking at Hawaii. Uh, so will you tell us a little bit more about your work and your actions? So <clears throat> one of the big differences, as she also pointed out, um, the the status of lakes in this open belt is very different from the status in, on the Deccan Plateau. And uh, one of the things you know in Kokan, wherever you go, even on the seashore, there will be a well on the seashore, which is fresh water. Because the runoff from the Western Ghats is going through that and you can get fresh water there. And because of the uh, rocky mountain structure, we have these lakes that form in the hills all over. You know, uh, there are now many developments happening around those lakes. 
uh, and so this was one of that kind of lake. In fact, Hawaii was created by British engineers. It wasn't there. The big system was the Vicar Lake. And uh, that is actually quite a, um, going back into archaeological times because uh, there, is, there are Buddhist caves from 2000 years ago. And so obviously it was a very living ecology at one time. Uh, so we tried to understand all of that and uh, we were trying to then think of uh, sources of the problems and then possible solutions. And it's kind of a long story but uh, one of the things, and the thing is only when you begin to explore, you stumble on efforts that others have taken up but that may, I'm not pointing to her in that context but others have taken up and they are left off because I, I'm sure girls are going to go far into the next century. But uh, so we found that uh, Raheza Foundation had actually commissioned a very extensive report on checking all the influxes into the lake and so on. So we found that and then we found of course the sources of pollution. There was some big housing residential colony that you know came up over there in the 90s and some of the erosion from that had filled the lake. IIT Bombay itself, because it always thought it was a little village, was just happily flowing things into the lake. There were uh, treatment plants, couple of treatment plants, but I don't think they were working very well. And amazingly enough, you know, Bombay was developed up to Dadar, and everything north of Dadar was suburbs, which did not have the traditional sewer system that the British uh, engineers laid in the main city. So even when I was growing up, even suburbs like Santa Cruz and Khar, they just had open drains. And that conversion kept happening, urban conversion. But Powai was on the fringe. So I may let you know that Powai finally has a working sewer system as of last year. <laughs> I mean, if you have been driving past there, there have been roadblocks because they are laying these pipes, you know, there would be 30 feet or so below. But that work is still ongoing. So we are uh, part of all of that and uh, so the thing we learned as uh, my friend uh, Nirmal who is also here in the audience, we realized that the task was really enormous and a lot of the things that she pointed out we encountered in the microcosm, uh, for example too many competing authorities. The moment we told the IIT system that what we, the minimum thing we can do is just build a nice walkway you know, along the lake, which would be both a containing thing, also set a boundary from uh, up to which you keep things clean and so on, and increase awareness. The institute engineer told us that there was city survey, which decides where our line is, and then there is a hydraulic engineer who tells whether the water is on your property or not on your property. And uh, if you could get, if you got onto wrong side of any of the authorities, then you would uh, really be in a lot of trouble. So then we decided that we will not uh, start building anything along the lake. Uh, and then we thought of uh, starting a awareness campaign in the locality. So there were several stakeholders, larger communities, one that was coming up across from us, the Iranlani Gardens Colony, and uh, then the Mulund and Ghatkopar people were also in the habit of coming to the Kauai Lake quite frequently. So all of those had to be in some ways involved, and uh, to tell you the truth, there were a lot of organizations sporadically holding rallies, something on Republic Day, they get a lot of children there, they wave flags, they form human chain, all these things were going on. And so we also got into this whole thing. We heard that uh, Parliament had some special committee or a very special allocation um, to heritage places and one of them was Powai Lake. So uh, we were, in our institute authority, the director at that time was also very active. His uh, wife, uh, Mrs. Rashmi Mishra was very active. So she started parlaying with the member of Parliament. So we were checking all the possible ways that we could put together you know, solutions, uh, ways of blocking the problem, influxes, trying to see who will put in the money. But then one finally we make, ended up making a calculation because there was a lot of silting. So one of the major problems was just silt and the lake is hardly six inches in most of the part that IIT handles it. 
and uh, we found that if we really had to dig it back to some reasonable level, it would be, he told me the numbers again right now. What about 20,000 trucks going for three years, just two weeks straight after cars? And, and, then, people work. <laughs> and if, you, if you did move it, where would it go? And uh, somebody said it could make bricks, but then you can't make bricks within city of Mumbai. And who will buy so many bricks when what is being constructed doesn't use bricks anymore? Uh, some people also thought of creating island, which I think has been done in some places in Mangalore. But any of those, if we just put the numbers, was in uh, three digit number of crores. And so it was nothing that we were going to be able to do. We did go and meet some authorities to see if they would move, you know. And then that we were available and that we had some um, some activity going and we could act as some kind of a channeling group. So this is the kind of kinds of things we did. And in the end we made a nice garden inside the campus going up to the lake, which at least kept that space clean from further development. That's what we have done finally. So, in the case of Pawai, what has worked? What has been the change story? Has there been a change? Actually, what has happened is that uh, either because we were working at the same time as other th people were working, or because we were working, other, I do know that the moment we got going, over the next two years, I kept getting invitations from uh, some Times of India group, whoever was holding some kind of a meeting. They kept inviting me because you are involved with this and since all of these guys were all over the place, I was the available person, so I ended up going to these. So I think there was uh, either because we were we had started talking and going and meeting a lot of authorities or maybe the time has come. The municipal corporation itself has now built a nice embankment, uh, a Chota Marindra if you like, mm -hmm. over there which you can, a longish promenade, almost 2.5 or 3 kilometers long. Um, and I think it is doing a good job of at least attracting a lot of people and since people do come, there is some incentive to keeping those areas clean and there are the large colonies nearby who also, for them it's a, you know, attraction point to, for real estate development. So, some improvement has definitely happened due to that. So, Pawai Lake, uh, I would say, uh, also, now that the sewer system is laid out completely, it's going to check a lot of the undesirable uh, inflows. The construction is more or less saturated now, so more uh, silt is not going to, you know, the construction silt is not going to flow in. So we have to wait and see, but now the rains have become suddenly very unpredictable and torrential. So we learned only in 2007 that we were sitting at the mode, the root of the Miti River, you know, that's what, where it comes from. The Bihar overflows over into Pawai and Pawai flows out through Marol into uh, the Miti River. So, the, when the water falls, it first falls on the IIT hill, <laughs> 24 inches in, you know, 40 inches in 24 hours. So, so you have a double responsibility so, for the cascade, right? <laughs> in a sense. But yes, so several things happened alongside both from city authority and uh, you know the drainage system these things are cleaned up so we hope that it will improve and uh, a largish crocodile was sighted last year <laughs> there is a youtube video of it uh, going around uh, so maybe there is good news there are, that the wildlife is reviving there okay. Okay. i mean we talked both uh, You've talked about the, the different <coughs> bodies that are in charge of the lake and the kinds of permissions one needs and the, you know, the cohesive thinking that needs to happen. Do you, um, you know, Vina, do you have a you know, idea where, where, or do you have an instance where different bodies cooperated well? Is this the case of uh, you know, Jhapur Lake or is this you know, where there was actually a will on the part of the different municipal and the different, you know, kind of water resource bodies uh, to cooperate. And what brought that? What was that a diktat from the you know center or was that a diktat or was that a local synergy at all? I think I can't think of a spontaneous case where they came came together. 
in Jakur, like I said, the citizen group has certainly forced that role where they've kind of, you know, called up this person and developed firstly personal relations with the relative nodal officers in each agency and then call them and, you know, invite them to a meeting and make sure that some degree of cooperation happens. Um, a place where it happened a little bit by Diktat was with Belandur Lake. The problem has not been solved. But at least Belandur Lake, and one of my colleagues, Charles Lele, was on that Belandur Lake, Lake Committee, where they uh, formed a Lake Committee which forced saying, okay, you know, this is a problem, let's bring all the agencies and at least have them look at the same data set and the same information set so that they're at least kind of pursuing the same solutions and, and so on. So they formed the Belandur Lake Committee which came up with a report and then that went, that was not actually tabled at the National Green Tribunal hearing on Belandur, but but at least it's in the public domain and the citizen group have access to it and so on. So I think the problem isn't solved, but it's not, an, I would, I think it's important to emphasize that it's not an easily solvable problem. Uh, the other place that I would say there was a little bit of cooperation between agencies has been with a uh, lake called Putinali Lake in, uh, in, uh, in Mango, which is, uh, where, which is one of the few lakes, so I don't know, I didn't mention this in my talk, but Bango now has what's called a zero liquid discharge law, which says that every large apartment complex which is larger than a certain size has to have its an in-house sewage treatment plant. Now, in some, it, this is great in some ways and crazy in some ways. It's great where there's, you know, greenfield development and the sewage system is not going to reach anymore. Then it's great to say we're building into the development. And some of these are actually the size of small US cities. I mean, we have 500, you know, apartments, yeah. complexes, a thousand or two thousand. So it makes sense to have kind of a sewage treatment plant. The problem is that uh, the BWS simply got a little bit overboard in kind of saying we are also going to now mandate that in old sewer part of the city where you know apartments have already been there for 15 years now, there also we are going to mandate uh, zero liquid discharge. And now suddenly those buildings are we have no land, land because we have land for it. So there is that. But one interesting development there was a number of these apartments which had successful social treatment plants said, look, uh, we have all these diversion issues, we have this lake behind our house, we have a social treatment plant, we are treating it and monitoring it. We would like to put our apartments lake, uh, our apartments treated sewage into the lake so that we've kind of rejuvenated this lake in our neighborhood, we've created a green space and so on. And uh, that was actually initially fought tooth and nail by Karnataka State Pollution Control Board because they said, look, if we start allowing this and tomorrow the lake goes bad, then who are we going to catch? Now, never mind that all of Bangalore's lakes are regularly getting treated untreated sewage. So, you know, in a sense, <laughs> leaving that aside, they were complaining, well, they didn't want to take the responsibility because then it would be their headache, people point fingers at them. But there are 10 different apartment complexes managing sewage treatment plants, putting their water, their treated wastewater into the lake, and suddenly one of the treatment plants will, you know, they will be there and have to go and find the culprit. So they fought it to the nail, but the citizen groups kind of persisted for a long time. They came up with some kind of monitoring protocol. So I think Putinali has had that uh, that uh, that experience in, of putting treated sewage. And I think that is one case of at least, if not interagency cooperation, but at least a sort of citizen groups prevailing on an agency to change its policy on something. Yeah, very interesting. You ended uh, with a very interesting uh, possible you know, solution. I mean, there are a lot of uh, people here who might be into design and into thinking about the cities of the future or you know the, the kind of tools and technology which is responsive to science and not moving away from science and doing its own, becoming its own monster, right? Which is the case we see with maybe a lot of boring beyond the level of imagination, which creates its own problems. But um, I'm just wondering, you know, when we think of those uh, kinds of solutions, uh, do you find um, you know, entrepreneurs, and this is again to both of you, you know, do you find, uh, and maybe some of you are also uh, water-based or solutions, you know, investing in the solutions in the social sector. So do you find that, uh, you know, corporations, which are big, you know, hugely responsible for some of the effluents into, um, into the lakes, uh, as you pointed out, at the individual level, if you, you cited some possible solutions, you know, are there, are there uh, you know, both monitoring guidelines or are there policies and regulations for corporations not to dump? Um, and are these being taken up seriously by the corporate sector, do you find in Bangalore? Corporations not to dump solid things or sewage? Yeah, sewage. Um, corporations for, for most part don't, I don't think the big IT 
key parts are the ones that are necessarily drawing the ones that are putting in social because through CSR and so on, I think a lot of particularly the tech, you know, the non-extractive, non-manufacturing uh, corporations uh, in Bangalore, there's a big ITBT sector, right? And I think they are reasonably socially responsible, but I think that they do have in-house treatment plants. A lot of them fund uh, CSR projects around this. So I don't think I would point to corporations for dumping raw sewage into lakes. The bigger problem is on the industrial efforts because there are no easy cost-effective solutions for industrial effluent. Industrial effluents are complicated. It doesn't involve just bacteria breaking stuff up, dump down. And so there, I think, is a big is the bigger place where I would say a lot of manufacturing. Yeah, I mean, like near Bombay, uh, this Vapi belt is known for you know having caused uh, such, such problems. Uh, but I am actually thinking of something else. It's it's the question of uh, whether some there would be some model that would invite a you know company to start a technology that will uh, help to solve the problem. So. Uh, Wherein the alumni had, I can say that we have uh, conducted a global business forum, you know, the IIT Bombay Alumni Association. And there were five or six verticals, including education, this, that. But one of them was water. And I know that several of our uh, alumni <coughs> who are either in corporate space or uh, in policy or in government, as well as a lot of very eager entrepreneurs who want to develop some things. Uh, are into it. Uh, also, back in IIT Bombay, we have a uh, Tata Center for Frugal Technologies, which is supposed to look for cheap technologies that will render something or the other. So you could always come up with some polymer or some technology that will help in purification, filtration, and so on. So hopefully, some of these technologies, funding, uh, policy, if these things come together, then we, I have a optimi I'm optimistic that it is not next century problem, but we are still in the early part of this century. So, um, I mean, I've asked you ways in which, uh, you know, we can, uh, citizens action or government action or, uh, or private and entrepreneurship action can uh, be part of um, the rethinking the water crisis and the and problems. So back to the science and back to the academy then, the research gaps. We, you know, can you tell us? And I, I'll, I'll have the last question on that, and then I'll open it up to you all. So, uh, in terms of research, what do we need? Uh, um, you know, would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, you kind of getting me on my copy also, and I'm going to actually outright maybe offend uh, my yes, yes. alma mater. Yes. And, and <laughs> so I think that uh, that. And, and we talked earlier today, so you know, I, I think there's such a huge research gap that I'm finding it difficult to find words for. But, but if you see, and I'd encourage any one of you to kind of uh, to, to, to do this, kind of do a Google Scholar search on, on some of these serious large scale problems that we have. And do a comparative search for even uh, similar problems in Vietnam or Cambodia, or the Mekong, or the, you know, certainly the US or. Uh, and there's no comparison because the kind of work that we're doing, the research that we're doing in India, sometimes feels like it has absolutely nothing to do with anything that happens in the real world. Sometimes I look at papers and wonder if we are living on the same planet or not. And that's not because our I, science and engineering is not important. That is important. But I think that we've created academic structures that have failed us on many, many levels. The first thing is interdisciplinarity. Nothing that I talked about today. And the reason I work for an academic think tank is and which has an interdisciplinary environmental PhD program is exactly this because it's so important for us to kind of ask important science questions and do rigorous science, but do it in a way that's social sen socially sensitive. So we need to inject the science into policy and we need to inject the society back into science. And I think we fail. So the kind of science that we do is not anywhere where it needs to be. And the reason, if you dig into the problems, is multiple. Firstly, we've created very rigid academies which can't actually build uh, more flexible structures. I went to an interdisciplinary program at Stanford, which, uh, but there are many equivalent programs at Berkeley and Yale. There's virtually nothing in India other than you know one that we are trying to do at Adrian. So I really think that we need all the ideas. Sitara is actually, to be fair, Sitara is kind of trying to trying to 
do some of that. So I do want to call I mean, Chitara really does a good job with her active office. But I think that we, we are very far away from doing rigorous science and matters to society. I also would like to say that our funding agencies, right now, if you see who funds this stuff, and I'm saying this as a plea to all of those who, who have any kind of influence anywhere, is that right now you have government agencies that fund. Uh, government agencies, for most part, fund government institutions. They are hesitant to fund non government. That's a separate thing, but we have a ton of money, and we talked about this earlier, that goes into CSR, that goes into interesting, in, increasingly private philanthropic foundations in India. But they all want to find people to do stuff. But who's checking whether any of this stuff works? Whether we have a knowledge base of people that can test if any of these things work? Whether we have feedback that goes back to those foundations? And so I would appeal to all of you who know foundations or work with foundations or talk to foundations ever, that some part of our budget in philanthropy, and it's great that we have so much private philanthropy in the country today, but some fraction of that, 10%, 20%, has to go both towards impact evaluation in terms of trying to understand at all whether this is done in a rigorous and independent way, and to developing a knowledge base so that we are actually building solutions that are robust and actually solve problems. Yeah, I agree with her. I mean, uh, that, so. Our problem is also a bit of the legacy problem because when the institution started, these uh, massive problems of urbanization that have suddenly cropped up in the last 20 years were not foreseen. So we have just built up along a vertical that just is going to compete with Western science or developments happening there and more as intellectual challenges and uh, training intelligent people. Uh, so, but see the, the fruits are here, right? So we have, we now have somebody who is the next generation. Right. <laughs> no, so, no, I think we have, we do have a lot of people who have gone into um, social sector. Yeah. And no, it has gone on a much more uh, scientific foundation scale instead of mere activism and so on. And uh, I think the institutions, within institutions also, there is a very serious dialogue along these lines. Uh, there are a lot of professors who feel that they are doing irrelevant work uh, and that only that kind of work getting recognition is causing a lot of problems. And I think slowly we are breaking out of it by creating these newer centers and newer platforms. And one of them also, as I was telling you earlier, uh, uh, is we also have a center for urban science and engineering, CUs, that was actually set up to compete with Columbia University <laughs> because the New York City had approached us to solve to uh, solve some of the problems. So there was a consortium of uh, four or five universities in the Northeast who are bidding for that and because our alumni or, or either faculty or uh, stakeholders there, so they had invited us to join that. And so there was a consortium of this kind from the East Coast where we were members, there was from the uh, West Coast and Columbia stood alone pitching for themselves. I, I guess they probably got the contract in the end. but uh, So we do have this center now. And I hope that as we go along, we create, uh, we break some of the barriers and create centers with newer perspectives for the younger uh, faculty and generations. Absolutely. And I think that is, uh, you know, the way we approach new challenges and the challenges that face us today in the 21st century is looking at these ways in which we go beyond the silos of the traditional disciplines. We keep the rigor but we definitely work together uh, on that and also beyond nations, right? So that we, I mean, Colombia is not just there, we are also here and we are actively seeking to be uh, spaces where knowledge from different uh, nations is on, particularly from India and what's being produced at Colombia, which is very, very international, is uh, brought in dialogue with each other as well as with our other centers, which are in very different parts of the world, whether in Africa, Latin America. So, I really think that uh, no, as Nehru had said in his speech at Columbia, you know, when he was talking about Asia at the time, that no country really can exist in isolation today. So it's it's with that spirit that we are here as the Columbia Global Center. I just want to thank both of you very much for a very, very engaging conversation, for provoking us. For